irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujran Zain, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujran Zain, and welcome to The Inner Voice Show. This show is about making a difference in your life so that you can create a free mind and a heart filled with love toward a fulfilling life for yourself and everyone around you. I'll bring you the latest research in the realm of human sciences, and we'll talk to experts in their field to bring you the jewel of their knowledge and wisdom. Let me tell you a little bit about my latest book, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Creating the Life that You Want. It's from the latest psychological model that I'm being presenting to you from Awareness Integration Model that has been done and presented to you in a series of exercises which you can complete in your own time. The Awareness Integration Model has been um, researched and published in many international um, publications. And uh, we've, uh, our latest research was with Cal State Long Beach students, which resulted in 68% minimization of depression and anxiety in a self-study format. So not even as a therapy, but a study, uh, self-study format, the same way that the book presents the exercises for, for you to go ahead and look into and uh, journal and learn and become more aware and integrate the past that you have had that kind of stayed somewhere around but not in your present moment and just leaks at time looking at the present moment and the skills that you have and the ones you don't have that you need to get and create an amazing uh, future for yourself you can get the life reset book from my website fujan.com f-o-o-j-a-n.com if you'd like to consult with me i have offices in irvine Woodland Hills and Beverly Hills. And I also consult online from everywhere in the world. So go to fushan.com. I love to hear from you and your ideas about the show. Today, I'll talk to you a little bit about a couple of researches that have come up and with Dr. Joe Court. We'll be right back. So the latest research that was published in um, Proceeds of National Association of Science Journal in January 9th, 2018, was that says that fraternal birth order effect on sexual orientation is explained. Um, this was done by Jacques Balthazar. Um, 20 years ago, Ray Blanchard and Anthony Bogart demonstrated that the probability of a boy growing up to be gay increases with each older brother born to the same mother, the so-called fraternal breath order effect. Their first investigation indicated that each older brother increased the probability of being gay by about 33%. This torturing phenomena was confirmed in multiple studies based on independent populations totaling over 10,000 subjects and a meta-analysis indicated that between 15% and 29% of gay men owe their sexual orientation to this effect. Despite this compelling evidence, a mechanism to account for the effect remained elusive. In PNAS, the journal, Bogart et al. present direct biochemical evidence indicating that the increased incidence of homosexuality in males with older brothers results from a progressive immunization of the mother against the male-specific cell adhesion protein that plays a key role in cell-cell interaction, specifically in the process of synapsis formation during development called neurolegion. The study provides the first data-based explanation for the Um, FBO effect and adds a significant chapter to growing evidence indicating that sexual orientation is heavily influenced by prenatal biological mechanism rather than by unidentified factors in socialization. The nature-nurture debate still rages in the minds of many scientists and scholars despite the consensus that these are complementary rather than 
mutually exclusive explanation. Another study says, in recent study published in the journal Biological Review, suggests that women's sexuality has evolved to be more fluid than men's as a mechanism to reduce conflict and tension among co-wives in polygamous marriages. Sexual fluidi fluidity encompasses how we identify our sexual preferences, such as straight or gay, our actual sexual behavior, sexual thoughts and fantasies, and genital or brain responses to sexual stimuli. Evolutionary speaking, sexual fluidity kept women mating and reproducing offsprings with their husbands even when their sexual preferences was not strictly heterosexual. Dr. Satoshi Kanazawa, led author of the study and the evolutionary psychologist at the London School of Economics and Political Science, explains genital and brain responses are the most objective and accurate measure of sexual orientation. In other words, genital and brain sexual arousal patterns measured via functional, MR, uh, functional MRI scans are seen as clear indicators of our sexual preferences. Scientists measure sexual preferences by looking at whether people engage in non-exclusive relationships or in unconventional sexual behavior or whether their sexual preferences change over time. We'll be right back with Dr. Joe Court. I'm so excited to have Dr. Joe Court uh, with us today. He's a licensed sex and the relationship therapist. He specializes in sex therapy, um, LGBTQ issues, and imago relationship therapy. He's the author of four books, 10 Smart Things Gay Men Can Do to Improve Their Lives, Revised and Updated, 10 Smart Things Gay Men Can Do to Find Real Love, L LGBTQ Client in Therapy, clinical issues and treatment strategies and is my husband gay straight or bi a guy for women concerned about their men a regular blogger for psychology today and the huffington post is on the teaching faculty of the university of michigan's sexual health certificate program dr court is also in partnership with modern sex therapy institute offering lgbtqia affirmative certification for helping professionals working with this population Dr. C Dr. Court, welcome to the show. Are you there? We're trying to get Dr. Court with us. Oh, there he is. Hello, this is Joe. Dr. Court, hi. We're on the air. And uh, All right. It's nice to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, wonderful. I um, stated two uh, types of studies about um, um, the gays and the lesbians and, and uh, the women, the fluidity of sexuality that has uh, become much more of the conversations that are um, here in our society right now. And I know that the concept of LGBTQA is going into uh, high schools, it's going into middle schools, and a lot more uh, people are really looking at the concept of um, uh, becoming aware of who they are earlier on in, in the age, um, or at least becoming accepting of who they are, and also accepting more of maybe the fluidity that also um, is, uh, is part of their experience. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, no, it is a wonderful thing. A lot of people are, are um, reacting to it, parents, adults, school teachers are panicking therapists because they're they're frightened what does this mean you know uh, teenagers especially coming in and they have all these different identities what are they supposed to do and you know I always kind of I try to help normalize this that we 
Teenagers, this is their job. What college am I going to go to? I have a different boyfriend every week, a different girlfriend, a different career. What am I going to do? And all their identity is swirling around, and now they have permission to have their sexual identity and their gender identity swirl around, which is a wonderful thing. They're not going to grow up later and and, um, wonder, uh, find out that there's something that they're not, where the generations before had to suppress all of this, repress all of this, and don't figure it out until they're in their 30s, 40s, or later. Um, yes, and I also have a lot of teenagers in my uh, office where they are labeling themselves also, um, let's say, uh, uh, too fast and too quick, and they're making a lot of life decisions based on the labels now that they attach to themselves. And then they go ahead and fight with the world, like they start fighting with their parents and the society and everyone around them, and uh, facing what happens, the stigma that's out there, and all the trauma that comes with that. And then about a year, two years afterward, um, they're like, "Oh, it was a phase that I was experiencing, and I'm really not that, and I'm shifting, and I'm." So somehow, I'm also experiencing some um, overt unnecessary traumatization as people are going through the stages. Can you talk a bit about that, too? Okay, so is this what I'm hearing you say, that they are making decisions and locking in an identity for a year or two and then going through trauma around that? Is that what you mean? No, going through trauma about it because they are not just experiencing it themselves, but because they're locking themselves into an identity. Now they fight with the the world around them, such as their family members, their mothers, their fathers, their extended family, and they get into a conflict with them because the parents might not be accepting of what's going on. So they it, it, it's now creating a little bit of unnecessary trauma between children and their parents in a very younger, early earlier age where the person has not has not necessarily uh, come to a space of oh I am heterosexual I am homosexual I am transsexual uh, but they're more experimenting but yet identifying as that experimentation yeah I mean well we I usually tell parents and when I do my talks around the country and I talk with people who work with teens I'd love to hear what your thoughts are too but usually everybody's just saying uh, and I do the same thing is sort of let your teen be the way they are and even if it's not true even if later they make a change that's okay that they're they're they need to be gender confirmed or sexual orientation confirmed and let them work this out themselves without everybody having negative backlash to them particularly the family the family's the backbone and research shows you know it's like number one a a highly rejecting family is going to create a highly suicidal and unstable child yes so i usually support them to you know and and yes they're going to they're going to experience more um negativity out in the world but I mean that's a that's what teenagers do in anyways. That's true. <laughs> that is. So you know true. what I mean, and, and that's what I mean. I just feel like people are like, oh my god, you know, what do we do? As if this is some brand new thing when we've had piercings and tattoos and hippies and we. I mean, this is like their job description. <laughs> That's very true, but I think that I uh, also, and I'm sure you do, I've uh, worked with a lot of different types of eth- ethnicities, which the concept of um, accepting their uh, young child, who's only maybe 11 or 12, who now has decided I'm transsexual or I'm homosexual or I'm, flu- uh, I'm trans, uh, you know, fluid sexual, and uh, they're going to have these conversations, <clears throat> and they, they insist to um, also externally um, uh, create that for themselves, and then the family yeah. is having a lot of conversations and issues about this is on this is not only in our family now. Now I have to answer to my aunt and my grandfather and everyone. Now yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, everybody is now being you know involved in this phase of this teenager in that way. Yeah, and so I, I see that as the same thing as somebody saying, I'm going to date outside my ethnicity. I'm yes. going to, you know, do things that go are counterculture to how you raised me. And um, it's the same thing. It's just another extension of that. And now the family has to deal with, and if they brace themselves too much against this, they're going to push their child into sticking to something that may not be right for them. 
Absolutely. So what is it that you want our audience to know? I know that you have uh, written four books and you teach um, uh, you teach people and therapists and clinicians um, a lot about the conversation about the adaptation of uh, who you are, about how to accept yourself, how to live, um, how to be in an amazing relationship. So tell us about your uh, what you want our audience to know. You know, I just want people to hear, like, some people will say, you know, for a generation that doesn't like labels, they certainly are making a lot of labels. And I hear that almost every day because it's my work. And my answer to that is, or my response to that is, they're making a lot of labels because the existing labels don't work anymore. Yes. What's happening is these kids and even young adults, and even adults now, it's moving to adulthood, they are saying, I want to make my own label. I want my own boutique identity. I don't want you to tell me that this label, I have to fit into this. I'm going to tell you what label is, and my labels could change throughout my life because I'm evolving as a person, and I'll decide who I am, and then I'll tell you, not the other way around. And I think this is, a, I actually think it's a beautiful thing to, to see this. I know it causes lots of uh, problems for people and family issues, and in the long run, I think it's going to be less of an issue for the actual individual. Where the other way around, you know, there's a, a gay comic, and he used to have this joke. He said, listen up, straight people. If you, if you let us marry each other, we'll stop marrying you. <laughs> and I love that joke because it's, the idea is that if you give us permission as children to know who we are and to experiment and play, then when we get to be adults, we won't injure you and we won't injure ourselves. That's what I want people to hear. And that is so true. And uh, when, you know, obviously I work with a lot of people who are coming out to themselves first and uh, and then to the, to the world around them. And uh, again, in many of the ethnic uh, families. And when they're not allowed to look at who they are, uh, it's much more confusing, and and uh, they try to uh, to be a lot of other people, and hold many uh, concepts of anxiety and shame and depression into their own space, which is so unnecessary to go through all of that when something is so natural for you. Very, and these kids today are going to have less of that. Yes. Yes, they will have less of that, except what I was also experiencing with the families having to face these issues so much quicker, where the ego yeah. state of their child has not even been set yet. And then yet yeah. the other good thing is that they do have support groups in schools, which uh, kind of holds them in that space until their family joins them in that space, let's say. But I like what you're saying because I teach the same thing. So they're they're having to differentiate with their child much earlier and more quickly than they would have to later as it goes on into later teens and young adulthood. It's kind of surprising, but if people could just find a way to self-regulate and figure out what is this bringing up for me? Yes, I'm going to have to deal with the, my grandmother who came from another country and won't understand this. That's part of being a family. How do you learn to have differences and you're becoming Americanized? You're beco you're you're your uh, child's going outside of the religion, the culture, these things happen. And rather than blaming the child and torturing them, what about everybody coming together and talking about the differences but working them through? And when we're talking about relationships, um, what are some of the um, facts that you would see uh, before our gays and lesbians or transsexual uh, couples or people who want to be a couple to really look into uh, creating um, a healthy relationship for themselves, one in their, in their intimate relationship or marriages, and then two, um, to extend that to their family members and society? Um, say the question. I, well, first of all, I want to just say one thing. We don't say transsexuals anymore. Transgender. Um, it's transgender, you okay. say. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, but, um, but what's the, the question is, how do I work with them? Is that what you mean? Yeah, what are some of the key factors that you would want to um, offer uh, yeah. gays, lesbian, transgenders, where they would, uh, you know, they would uh, intend to be in a great relationship and, and also have that be a part of their family and community? 
Well, here's the thing. A lot of people um, will, and a lot of therapists, it's one of my pet peeves, they'll say, a couple is just a couple. I'm a couples therapist. I work with couples. I'm gay friendly. I'm lesbian friendly. And I want people to hear that that's not true and it's not fair. While we have a lot in common, we're very different. Two men have been socialized completely different than two women have been socialized. And so the, the, the doubling factor that goes on in a gay and lesbian relationship must be uh, acknowledged. Whereas when you have a straight couple, one is heteros- I mean, one is male, one is female. There's a uh, there's a whole different dynamic that goes on, and so people don't understand this, and um, they also don't recognize that with gay and lesbian couples, they have to deal with internalized homophobia. In other words, you know, their whole life has been spent learning to be have a disgust response or have a negative fear around if people are going to accept them or not. And so then when they get into relationship, that fear becomes doubled. And so now as a couple, they're fighting it, and they're, they're dealing with what are two men um, issues that go on between two men, and what are the two issues that go on between two women. And those are very specific to gay and lesbian couples. And what would be the issues that would be more uh, prevalent for a gay couple? So like a gay male couple, what you would see, uh, there's more of a sexual openness. So this is like a gender base, too, that men are given permission in our culture to be more sexually open. And so and when the gay male couples, 50% of gay male couples have an open marriage, open relationship. Um, in other words, they have a contract and agreed upon uh, agreement that says it's okay to go outside the relationship and they have do it together, they do it separately, they have a don't ask, don't tell, only on vacations, whatever it is, and a lot of people see that as cheating or, you know, some kind of problem that they're not monogamous, but this has been the case since the beginning of gay time, that gay male couples have had open relationships successfully, and um, people, so I want people to know that that's a normal cultural understanding of these of two men. The other thing is, because they've been socialized as males, they've turned their back on vulnerability as we teach boys to do. We teach them to not be dependent, but to be independent. We teach them to be the breadwinners, the uh, high achievers. And now we have two of these men in the relationship who are taught, really, we teach boys how to, we teach them out of relationship. We sort of, we tell them we can't, they shouldn't touch each other, they shouldn't have feelings for each other. So now, just because they're gay men, those, that socialization comes with them. So I always feel like as a therapist, I'm like the woman in the relationship. Women teach men how to come into relationship because boys have been taught to, to you know, be taught out of relationship. But when you're two men, that doesn't happen. There's no woman. So nobody's teaching them how, how to be in relationship. So that's like a ver- those are two specific things for gay male couples. Um, we're talking to Dr. Joe Court and uh, about uh, male sexuality and female sexuality and gays and um, lesbians and transgenders. Um, one of the things that I saw and I experienced a lot with um, my gay friends, couples, or uh, my clients, and I've seen it with both gays and lesbians, I just want to check this out with you and your experience. Many times I've seen that regardless of... Um, the genders, when they came together, there was um, a sense of uh, a balance that got created between the couple where one held more of the feminine qualities and another one more of the masculine qualities, and they balanced that piece together. And you see that also in heterosexuals, regardless of gender. Like sometimes the female might be more, holds more of the masculine side and the, you know, the male holds it. So regardless of the gender, uh, there's some sort of this type of a balance that begins to play uh, in a relationship. Have you noticed that, or is that something that I'm coming up just uh, my figment of my imagination. <laughs> no, no, I have noticed that. Like you said, even in straight couples, but in straight couples, sadly, they're they they're still um, limited by enforcing the gender norms in each other. Yes. I mean that's changing slowly. But gay and lesbian couples, we've never had that. What somebody's got to do the yard, somebody's got to do the dishes, somebody's got to help raise the kids. So it, it's what happens in gay and lesbian couples is. It's what, what comes naturally to you, what comes naturally to me, and how are we going to do this, not based on gender role, but based on the task at hand. 
And then when um, uh, talking about the lesbian couple, what would be some of uh, the uh, issues that might arise or some of the natural um, expressions that might be there that might be different, for example, than heterosexual couples or gay couples? Yeah, so for lesbian couples, the research shows that there's a doubling factor as well. So they, they might, so women uh, tend to be more relational. So there's a joke in the gay and lesbian community, what do women bring on a, what do lesbians bring on a second date? A U-Haul. Um, what do gay men bring on a second date? What second date? So those jokes are very gender-based, right? Yes. So with two women, they might partner up very fast. Um, they might um, have, they might have, they're so other focused that there might become an enmeshment or sort of an uh, you and I are one and I'm the one or you and I are one and you're the one. There's not a tolerance for two separate people, which every couple deals with and, and has to address. But lesbian couples, I find, and research shows, has a little bit more difficult time negotiating separateness and togetherness. The, the separateness is, is threatening to the, to the women in the couples. And... Um, Oh, there was something else I was going to say that I see a lot of with them. But basically, uh, oh, sorry. The, the other thing is, no matter what, if the, the, however long they've been together, if the romance dies and the sex dies, the sexual desire die, dies, when they end their relationships, they stay friends. Their friendship endures. W- women couples are very much into the bond and the relationship with each other, which I don't see so much in straight couples or gay couples. Mm-hmm. And then when we're talking about transgender, um, usually we don't have transgender couples. Usually we have one uh, person who's transgender and chooses to be a couple with a male or a female, right? We rarely see, that. I, I don't know of any actually, that I've seen that a transgender has actually uh, been a couple with another transgender because... Oh, I've seen that. We see that here in my practice. Oh, Um, do you? Okay. Yep. And what is also becoming more common is trans men and lesbians being in relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's a growing um, uh, situation where, uh, and I I don't know enough about it. I know it exists. I know people that are in these relationships, but I don't, and and I certainly don't see it as pathological. I see it as what we're finding is people are not so concerned anymore about gender and orientation as they used to be. My experience with working with transgenders uh, throughout, like, you know, six or seven years through the whole process of changing their uh, their bodies also um, and becoming ex- uh, externally the gender that uh, they, they are, um, I have noticed that there's more difficulty in how to find a mate out there um, because, uh, because of uh, usually... Uh, gay uh, homosexual gays are together they they're men who are attracted to men or lesbians are women who are attracted to women and then um, so um, and then heterosexuals or men and women who are attracted to each other and sometimes the fluidity or the concept of you know who am I and who do I present externally and who do I uh, get attracted to and get attracted upon uh, becomes a little bit more um, they're out of the category so it takes a lot more conversation and sometimes a lot more trauma as you find your space with attraction with another person who gets also attracted to you yes yeah well i here's what i started uh, teaching therapists and and really everybody should know this just because somebody tells you they're gay or lesbian uh, or, or bisexual or even straight that doesn't tell you anything about their sexual history, and it doesn't tell you anything about their sexual behavior. Um, it used to, we used to all just think, well, if you're gay, then you've had sex with men. If you're uh, straight, then you're only having sex with the opposite sex. Not true. We're starting to realize, people are starting to open up, that people are having all kinds of sexual experiences with the same gender, opposite gender, and that's what you're calling the fluidity. Sexual fluidity is that Your primary sexual orientation is to men, to women, to both, but that every once in a while, if you're straight and the same-sex person can come along, if you're a woman or uh, another woman, if you're a man or another man, and you're able to engage in a sexual relationship and even romantic relationship with this one person. 
And people say, well, isn't that bisexuality? And the answer is no, because bisexuality means that it generalizes beyond other people of the same sex. In sexual fluidity, it's only this one. It's episodic. It's incidental. It's, it's specific to this one or um, two other people kind of thing. It, it doesn't generalize. And we, there's actually a term for it now. They're called heteroflexible. Right, So you can be also gay and lesbian and only be attracted to same sex, but every once in a while the opposite sex comes along, and you can be homoflexible. So there was um, some studies uh, that, um, and I forgot right now all the details of the study, but it just came up for me where the, they were scanning uh, with under the fun- functional MRI. They were scanning the brain of um, heterosexuals, homosexuals, and what they were finding was that um, the uh, the frontal cortex was um, uh, reacting to uh, the same uh, the, the same way of a love uh, type of a relationship that they would get attracted to either the same gender or the opposite gender, and that's how they were looking at whether you were homosexual or uh, heterosexual because of um, your brain. Uh, interacting that way uh, altogether. But what I'm hearing from you is that there's a fluidity in that people can have obviously sexual experiences have utmost level of pleasure um, with uh, the fluidity of any gender if they choose to and if they got attracted. They can also fall in love with um, uh, with anyone, uh, because love can also be open to anyone. But the concept of bringing them together as a lifestyle is is what you can bring in and make it heterosexual or bisexual or uh, homosexual. Is that what I'm hearing from you? That's exactly what. That's exactly right. Yep. And um, it's, so that's why when someone says they're gay, I say to them as a therapist, "Have you ever had a, a sexual experience with the opposite sex?" If somebody tells me they're straight, I say, okay. For, and actually, what I say to people is, can you tell me what that means to you? Because what gay or lesbian or transgender or bisexual means doesn't, isn't the same for every single person that walks through my door anymore. Everybody's got their own t- tailored um, you know, response and definition. And um, then I ask, does this, uh, have you ever, a straight person, I'll say, have you ever had sex with somebody of the same gender? Because I don't assume that just because you're straight doesn't mean that you haven't. Mm-hmm. And many times, um, it's great that there is there are societies and laws and all of that changing, which all of this is becoming open. But because of uh, cultures that are still not open, we still have a lot of uh, gays and lesbians who are choosing to choose a heterosexual lifestyle in order to have their family system, in order to have their children, uh, the particular work they want, and all of it, and not necessarily come out in the society or live in that way while they are, they know that they are, and they might have uh, relationships who are homosexual or just experiences with the same uh, sex which are sexual. Yeah, um, that's a really good thing that you're pointing out, because people don't understand, and I have to be honest, in the 90s, I didn't understand. I was a young, gay, affirmative psychotherapist, and I would get um, Asian American men, African American men, Middle Eastern, so I'm from Detroit, Michigan. We have the highest population of Middle Eastern people in Dearborn, Michigan, and I'd get these Middle Eastern men, and, and some women, coming to my office and telling me that they don't want rejection from their family, that discrimination in is so severe in white circles that they don't want rejection from their family of origin, so they're going to live a heterosexual life. And they wanted me to support them in that and help them do that, not change their orientation, but change, uh, support the life of being heterosexual. And back then, I wouldn't do it. I didn't understand that for them, because back then, it was all new for uh, APA, you know, American Psychological and Psychiatric Association and social work and counseling organizations all were saying living a life in the closet would be living a life of depression. Yes. And that's where I was. But these people would tell me coming out of the closet for me would be a life of depression. So today, when these people come to my office, the same people, I mean, not the same, but the same profile, I support them in what, wherever they need to go. If they're going to if they're Middle Eastern, if they're religious, whatever you know their ethnicity or religiosity or culture is, we look. I explore: is this really 
because of that, or is it internalized homophobia? Is you know, internalized homophobia is horrible. Most yes. people have it until they come to terms with their their being gay, straight, bisexual, or trans. And if they say no, this is really true. It's family related. Then I will be a therapist, helping them determine their their own right as to where they want to live. Yes, it seems like in cultures who are more family-oriented, like the whole culture is more societal and family-oriented, and individualism is really not uh, part of the game of the culture, then we see a lot more of uh, sexual preferences or orientation or, um, you know, uh, uh, love that they have. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily belong to them. It's the role, the societal roles that uh, gives a lot of perks where if you live in those societal roles you will get a lot more benefit and then somehow um, you know you sacrifice the individualism in many realms because of the perks that are there in the bigger culture yes absolutely now, your, your book about um, um, women finding out whether their husbands are um, straight or bisexual, uh, tell me a little bit about that book and why is that a consideration that you needed to uh, write a book about it? Because I hear that a lot. I hear a lot of, uh, this is another myth, uh, which I like for you to open up. Many times I've heard from women that when, for some reason, the sexual experiences with their men are not that great or the men are having some uh, conversations or issues or uh, not uh, being able to have uh, erection or they're not that interested, uh, but they're still going out with it, even getting married, and then suddenly the converse, the first question is, are they gay? There isn't any other question except that one first comes up. And I've always asked, why is that question coming up first versus, you know, are we out of love or are we intimacy or they're not into me or many other questions? So um, please answer those questions for me. I love that you're bringing that up because that's so true. And that's, uh, I see that in my office all the time because, uh, you know, I always tell people just because I'm gay and a lot of my writings have been gay, um, people only think I only see LGBT people. And I jokingly say, well, first of all, I, it's not a joke. In Detroit, I could have never made a, a practice out of just LGBT. I, I mostly see straight people because, um, you know, the, there's not enough LGBT around here. And so people will call me and say, do you, you know, Joe, do you see straight people? And I have to say, I feel like the kid in the sixth sense, I see straight people. Like, I'm whispering this, you know, like I'm that kid. And I'm like, of course I do. And when I do see straight people and sex has waned or he, he's had um, less interest in her or whatever it is, her first thought is, you must be gay. It's just exactly what you said. And, um, you know, often that's not the case, obviously. But sometimes it's because she's found gay porn. She's found him on Craigslist. She's found him uh, with a receipt to a bathhouse. And, or, it, or it comes out that he's had some interest in gay sex. And often what the, the reality is, is it's not about him being gay and it's not about him being bisexual. It sometimes is, but, but uh, other times it's he has interest in gay sex, not in, gay, not in men. And people don't understand the difference. The difference is we have a sexual orientation to whom we're attracted to, male, female, both, neither, let's say. Then we have an erotic orientation. These are the sexual desires, positions, fantasies, kink, vanilla that we get into that brings us to orgasm. Those are two different, sometimes they're aligned, so you can be straight with erotic fantasies that are toward the opposite sex, you can be gay with erotic fantasies toward the same sex, or you could be straight with erotic fantasies toward gay sex. So it's, it's or you could be gay with erotic fantasies toward straight sex. So it doesn't line up the way people want it to. Yes, I've noticed um, working with a lot of people that um, their experiences or their fantasies in their teenage years or even childhood, um, whether it was traumatic or wasn't, even whether it was a, even uh, a conversation of that they were molested or they weren't, they saw uh, sexual experiences uh, that uh, just showed up in front of them. Uh, some yep. of them became traumatized and some of them were not at all traumatizing. Um, and they, uh, those uh, experiences become part of people. 
and uh, they become part of the sexual desires or fantasies or fetishism or just, you know, a way that they will explore. And that You're doesn't right. mean anything about whether you know, they are, that's their orientation or not. Right, we get erotically imprinted, so absolutely, whether it's trauma or not, um, a lot of what I see, I spent two um, chapters on this, is my husband gay straight or bi, because I see it so much, where men have been sexually abused, or their first sexual experience was with somebody who um, took advantage of them, or um, it, was a, it was their first time, and that becomes part of their erotic interest, even though it might have come from abuse and somewhere traumatic, um, and let's say we do the trauma work and the healing, and they um, they work it through. They often still have sexual interest in the same gender, who um, you know, because the imprint was from a same gender. And a lot of therapists uh, don't appreciate the fact that this doesn't have to mean that they're still in trouble or still um, they're not healed. It can very much mean that now they get to own this as their own orientation. Because what's true is all of us, no matter what happens to us in childhood, a lot of that material, a lot of those um, experiences get eroticized later in life, whether it's positive or negative. And I've also experienced with transgenders where um, there many of the people who can be um, uh, um, cross-dressing and where they get a lot of high levels of sexual desire with cross-dressing, and they're not transgenders at all. Oh, thank you. Right, I have another whole chapter on that. The men who get off on cross-dressing are heterosexual cisgender men. Cisgender means they were born with male, uh, with um, a penis and testicles, assigned male at birth, and they're aligned with being male. They're not trans. It's the opposite of trans. They're cisgender heterosexual men that get off on feeling like a woman. They don't want to be a woman. They don't think they are a woman. They just are aroused by that. And a lot of straight women get really turned off. And sometimes they'll even divorce their husband because they can't get past the fact that he does this. It's really, a, it's really sad. Yes. I have uh, almost five uh, marriages and relationships that are pretty much ending uh, because either the man has to stop and uh, let go of what makes them really want to have fun. And, uh, and, and even bringing their wife or their mate into this conversation and uh, the mate is not at all willing to be a part of. So uh, let, let's talk about that. We have about uh, a little bit more time. Uh, let's talk about all of these differences um, that people have. And everybody has the right to their own. Uh, as long as they're yep. not, you know, shoving it in somebody else's throat or pushing somebody or, you know, do a crossing boundary. I mean, everyone has the right to their own uh, experience. Um, and then yet when they come and become couple, there's so many ways of, you know, the intimacy conversations and how to communicate and how to negotiate and bringing all of this together. And and I'm saying this across heterosexual, gays, lesbians, transgenders, all of them. Um, and then there are these eroticism and fantasies and sexuality that we just can't negotiate. It's like uh, maybe our brain, maybe our logic can negotiate, but our feelings just will refuse and it will show uh, because the person would lose interest. Like they can't be attracted to someone who they can't uh, fathom being together in the same way sexually, and they can't, yeah. you know, what do we do with that? Well, so I call that, um, they, they have a disgust response is what happens, and they can't get past their disgust response, and we're having a lot more information and research going on now about disgust responses. In fact, you can look it up on TED Talks, and they're starting to talk about how political um, programming uh, and campaigning appeals to people's disgust response, and it will move you to how you'll choose to even vote. And so in sexuality, it's the same thing. It's called erotophobia, the fear of sex, the disgust of sex, the, the, the disgust of certain kinds of sex. And as therapists, we're always dealing with differences with couples, parenting differences, financial differences, maintaining a house differences, but we don't do a good job, if we even do this at all, in erotic differences. So couples come in, and of course they have erotic differences. They haven't talked about it. And your erotic uh, lives um, 
evolve over time. So what you didn't like at 20, maybe what you're so into at 40, but your partner may not be into it. And therapists, unfortunately, are so uncomfortable with this that they either don't have the conversation, shut it down, or align with the partner they're comfortable with, rather than letting these couples talk through and work through how are we going to do this if we 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 can stay married can we find a middle ground in what turns you on that might turn me off as long as it's not you know it's not illegal it's not putting you at risk for stis you know and and there's a opportunity here to learn from each other most couples have a hard time with that very much. I've noticed that uh, part of uh, having uh, a, a hard time is not only that we can negotiate to do to be a particular way we that we both like together, but now that I know that you like something else, I'm always worried that you're going to be um, uh, searching and uh, going to that route, and that's not a place I'm willing to offer or I can offer to be with you uh, and you can you know you can usually find this in the realm of sexuality uh, more yep. than you can find this in any other uh, realm that the that the couple is negotiating on like you don't get yep. upset if you say you know I love my family I want to see them and it's okay if you don't like them as much as I do or you don't enjoy them so I'll just go see my co- you know my family yes. more and you can be home doing whatever you like or I'll go with the boys and you can go with the girls and you can have fun you can have enjoy uh, but when it comes to sexuality, that part of us which gets really insecure that it should be very kind of like, you know, those exclusive or I'm going to have a hard time imagining that you would be somewhere else doing, uh, you know, having sex or eroticism or enjoying that sexual experience in another format. It's excruciating and painful for people. So true. That's so true. That's so well said. So, uh, I see it all the time. So we have about four minutes. Um, I want to give this completely to you to, uh, uh, you know, do a myth busting or uh, give as much as you like to give to our audience to know about uh, your expertise and the realm that you work with. Just the whole idea that sexual health conversations are so important, and one of my biggest idols uh, is Esther Perel, yes. and she talks so well about this, and I, I just want to quote her a little bit and talk about how couples don't talk about sex until something bad happens, infidelity, jealousy, then suddenly, at a crisis point, sex comes up. That's not true with gay and lesbian couples. We talk about it from the beginning. In fact, gay men talk about it from the beginning of their ad. I could read you ad after ad on a gay male dating site, and we start with, what are you into? What do you get off on? Because we want to know right away, are we going to be erotically matched as well as romantically matched? Straight couples don't do this. And it's, too, it's very sad because by the time they do that, they're in crisis. But the good news is, by the time they do it, if it is in crisis, if it's because of infidelity, if it's because of you know finding one's porn or whatever it is, somebody's porn or, or, or whatever, um, on the other side of this, the research is in the favor of the couple. They get better. They do better. Why? Because they started having a sexual health conversation that needed to happen from the beginning of the relationship that they wouldn't have and they didn't have. So that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway I'd love people to learn. So talk about your sexual preferences, what your needs and desires are, and explore with each other uh, and learn and be interested uh, to, to, for your, to know your partners. So that interest yes. that we create, uh, then uh, we will go after it, we'll talk about it, we'll ask about it, we'll expand ourselves into this different versions of experimentation, which um, they're all pretty much set up for pleasure. I mean, it's not that everybody has pleasure over everything, but the whole concept is set up. That's the whole intention. The intentionality of it is is pleasure. So it's like opening yeah. yourself up to play and pleasure and um, and not have so much fear around it while the, the structure of the relationship uh, or the agreement or whatever it is, it's safe enough for the person to be able to explore and put themselves out there. Yep, having erotic curiosity. Erotic curiosity. Um, how can people find you and your book? They can find me on my website. They can go to www.joecourt.com. And um, on that website, 
there'll be links to everything that I do, including um, the sexual fluidity pieces, and then my emails on there as well. Do you also see clients out of the state on 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 um, like consulting? I know you can't do therapy out of state, but uh, do you do uh, uh, people calling you, or uh, is or it, people can only see you if they are in that state? No, I do it. I do consultations and I, I do some coaching. I, I don't do therapy, obviously, because right. we can't, but I do yeah. coaching and consultation because I've written so much and there's so many people from all over the world that contact me that say, can you just guide me in the right direction around whatever it is? And so, yeah, I do that and they can co- contact me through, I'm on, I use VC, V-S-E-E dot com. It's a, like a Skype for telehealth mm-hmm. and, um, or they could call me at, on the number on my website. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I know it took us a while to have you here at our show. It's been great to have you. I learned a lot from you, and uh, it's been great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and thanks for being patient with me. (laughs) Oh, of course. It's been a great pleasure. And for everyone, um, thank you for listening with your heart, with, uh, with opening your mind, with freeing it, and allowing yourself to learn um, and explore with us and I would love to hear from you just go ahead to my web- website fujan.com f-o-o-j-a-n.com and give me your comments questions um, interest and uh, love to hear from you and until next week create a wonderful world for yourself and everyone around you bye bye You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujan Zain, only on L.A. Talk Radio, 105.7.